Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to the second day of this workshop. We will start with uh, session three, uh, methodologies for big data. Uh, it will be the same format as yesterday. Do the introduction first, and then uh, uh, the two speakers uh, from uh, ISTAT colleagues, and then we'll be follow up with a discussion from Pete Das. Uh, from the Netherlands office, and then there will be a, a point of view from the production, from uh, um, uh, ESTAT, and then we will go open to the floor discussion. <laughs> Sorry about the sound. Okay, so Mauro, if you are able to put up, I prepared some, I prepared some, um, slides so that I can see uh, what I'm talking about so that I'll be able to stick to the time but uh, <laughs> okay I'll read through it okay please go on to the first page All right so ab about big data so here's a summary that uh, in a recent paper we gave about so basically we said uh, it's it's the key thing is a non-survey the not planned survey data uh, ideally it should be big too so uh, we include all type of data like registers, transaction data, uh, remote sensing, whether the sensor is fixed or mobile, and then you have internet. So all these are examples of the data we could be uh, talking about today. And uh, I highlighted the B2B transactions, the satellite image, the web page, social media, some of the things that actually today we will be used as example as far as I can understand from the paper. So go on next, please. So basically, it's a lot of data that is not from the uh, planned surveys or sensors and so on. Just data is already there using secondary, and ideally, there's a lot of uh, in terms of amount. Uh, go on to the next page, please. So uh, with the uh, to prepare you for the sessions, because obviously we have only a few talks, so we cannot cover all the whole range of things. I want to mention three aspects of key issues to, to why you were uh, listening to the talks. So I think three keywords, access, process, and assess. And uh, interrelated to all these three aspects, there is ultimately a question of which parameter, which statistics, which target we want to use when we have these new data or unconventional data. That is a question sooner or later we'll enter as well, although we probably won't be touching on that aspect too much. Uh, the presentation today will be more related to process aspect, so and actually more specifically to the measurement aspect. So from organic data like text, image, rather than structured uh, numeral alphabetic data to start with. So a lot of work need to do with this kind of new non-survey big data sources. Uh, there will be other aspects related to this process, like representation, order, and the coverage, selectivity, integration of multiple sources, and so on, which we will not necessarily explicitly touch on today, but it will be sort of, uh, you, you, would, you would have sensed this throughout the workshop anyway. So these are all issues that's related to process. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, quality perspective or how you arrange from sort of a total sort of design perspective, uh, the total error concept, I think you will, uh, you will um, uh, uh, be reminded of the process pipeline. I have some references. Uh, originally was sort of had admin data in mind, but you can judge for yourself whether you come to big data source, this kind of total error framework is still relevant or not, is it still something needs to be uh, improved. And I, another question I also felt uh, throughout the uh, sort of also yesterday is the, I sense a kind of oscillation between the, you know, the generic standard process versus stovepipe process, because this kind of new data source very often you need to develop something very specific for that source in order to make use of it, which maybe quite goes against the otherwise push for general standard sort of process at the offices. So, and I, I guess it's not the sort of one way or the other, but I can, I feel like historically there will be a, are we building no big data stove pipes? I'm just saying, okay. That's, that's an issue I think will come and go, things like that. Okay, so the next issue, access. I want to emphasize the access and assess. 
I just read out directly. Uh, survey respondents are usually provided with an assurance that their responses will be treated confidentially. These assurances may relate to the way their responses will be handled within the agency conducting the survey, or they may relate to the nature of the statistical outputs of the survey. That's from Chris Skinner's chapter on disclosure control. And traditionally, more effort has been on the output rather than the processing or input part, the privacy uh, uh, control. Um, the second Quote, personal data must be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose of their uh, possessed for. That's from the GDPR Article 5. So it's a data minimization principle. I think both principles are becoming more urgent in, the, in these kind of... Uh, when we move from the state-owned or administrative data to private handled or owned data sources, these two issues become commercial actors. These two issues become much more urgent. The national uh, NSO or NSI is not state-sponsored Facebook. We cannot just go and grab all. We will be resisted. So therefore, we need to put attention on uh, data access. There will be a legal aspect. There will be so on. But we definitely need to do something with the privacy control during the collection and process in order to lower the threshold for acceptance. So UNEC, for example, has already organized uh, some kind of uh, input privacy sort of position project. And uh, yesterday I talked to Fabio, he mentioned to me um, some uh, Eurostat effort doing some conceptual things. And I think it's, so this is receiving more and more attention internationally. And I referred to one paper uh, recently in uh, Series A. It's in honor of Chris Skinner, actually, I wrote the paper. Uh, secure big data collection and processing framework means opportunities. And the system we built there will be implemented for transaction data, uh, receipts and, and uh, debit card. You want to link them and then make statistics out of them. So you need to uh, have a system on that. Thank you. Move on, please. Um, now coming to assess. Um, Again, I quote directly, uh, wherever the goal of survey sampling is to produce a point of estimate of some target parameter of a given finite population, auditing aims not to estimate the target parameter itself, but some chosen error measure of any given estimator of the target parameter, which may be biased due to failure of the underlying model assumptions or other favorable conditions that are necessary. So this is what it means, what's the difference between audit sampling and survey sampling. The framework of inference for auditing is design-based, given a finite population, from which the random sample is taken under probability design. But the outcomes of interest and any other values known separately from sampling are treated as fixed. So therefore, it's design-based error measures you're trying to calculate. So design-based auditing inference is valid regardless the models and algorithm underlying the estimators being assessed. And I think this is uh, something we just have to face up. There's no way you can uh, model and assess your uncertainty in a sort of traditionally accepted way in official statistics by the model itself. Uh, move on to the next pages. And at the next page, I think we'll give you clearer. So we had always grown up with this uh, design model based uh, 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 controversy or debate. If you look at these two times two tables, so your estimate can be motivated as a design-based estimator or as a model-based estimator. But you can also evaluate any given estimator either from a design-based property point of view or from a model-based point of view. Presumably, you have a probability sample to start with, not a non-probability sample. The diagonal, if it's model design-based estimator, design-based inference, that's what we call survey sampling traditionally. Uh, the second diagonal element, model-based predictors and model-based inference, that's what we call prediction. The two off-diagonal cells has traditionally been quite neglected. Uh, weighting is inefficient. That kind of uh, argument is typically from a model-based point of view to evaluate a design-based estimator. Then you say, why do you wait? You should just calculate the OLS. Don't bother the sampling weights, understand? That's inefficient, that type of argument. But it's never done systematically. The other upper corner, that's where the auditing sampling is. You gave me a, a, a blob, I'm going to evaluate its design-based mean square error. That is audit sampling. 
Okay, you can always do that. Traditionally, this has been done too little. Although the idea is originally already in the um, Maddow et al.'s paper, 83, so basically they, they warned the danger of a model misspecification, right? A model misspecification leads to bias. What is that bias? That, that is a finite population bias. Under the models, there's no bias. That's the point. So, but it's not really pushing the button to the end. The button, pushing the button to the end is you can give me any estimate. It doesn't matter how you motivate it. You can dream of it. I don't care. I'm going to my probably my sample you 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 calculate the estimate from is a probability sample. So therefore I can calculate with respect to repeated sampling the property of your estimate. That's my design based property of whatever your estimate you have. Okay? And that is got, so a model based estimate can can very well have a smaller mean square error, design based mean square error than Horowitz, Thompson, then Greg, whatever. It's possible, so just go for it. So no more argument. I don't need to assume philosophically there is a true model. I don't need to assume philosophically I can do infallible learning. Irrelevant, I don't need that. All the sampling gives you this universality of sampling applied to inference. Okay, you may argue this error measure is not relevant or we can accept the other sort of validity measures and so on. Yes, leave that debate aside. It's all possible. But at the moment, if you want something that you're familiar with, you can accept this is the thing you can do. So some applications I'm talking about, for example, scanner data proxy uh, expenditure weights. So it's, it's just the, the scanner data uh, contributed weights versus the expenditure survey. It can be shown that it's much, much, much better. You need to 100 times size of the <laughs> expenditure survey to get as close, the variance who can get as close to the bias, basically, something like that, okay? Um, another example uh, coming from the, uh, we take the inspiration from the Dutch social media. So they showed a graph, if you remember, there's a very close correlation between the social media index and the confidence index, right? So we've just said, okay, we can also do something more. We say, if we treat the customer's confidence survey as a auditing sam sample, then I can actually develop a test and the, the, the variabilities with re repeat to the sampling variance. Right? I can develop tests, test something about whether they are targeting the same parameter in some sense, so like that. You can do something like that. And uh, recently, uh, uh, colleagues at uh, Stats Italy has also been talking about the statistical framework for register based population size estimation, where they start to taking into the idea of how do you do audit sampling. So I can produce the population counts by purely register-based methods. So I don't need any survey for that. However, I know this number is not perfect. I need to say something about the error, so I can conduct an audit sampling. Not, like, not a traditional coverage. Traditional coverage means that I want to do the coverage survey, and that coverage survey and the census together, I'm going to produce an estimate. Here you say, no, the register is giving me the number. I just want to use the sample to say how good, how bad it is. So you don't need to do this all the time. You can take a much smaller sample and so on and so forth. Okay, that's the auditing idea. Okay, okay with these things in mind, I think access, process, and, and, and uh, assess, and I'll leave you to the, uh, the talks today. Uh, primarily, we'll be focused on the process, but don't forget about the other issues. And say, okay, thank you. So I go on to the um, first speaker model, please. Hello, hello to everyone. <laughs> nice to be here today, super happy. So my, my presentation is gonna be a little bit more broad. So the idea is that I will try to give you an overview of ESTAT activities in the context of big data, which is quite challenging, as Zhang <laughs> said this morning. And before starting, I would like to thank Monica Scannapiego. We did this presentation together. As many know now, she's currently working at Agenzia per la Cybersicurezza Nazionale. I don't know how to translate it in English, something cybersecurity or something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let's start. I will try to be brief. Uh, I prepared a huge amount of slides. I will not go through all of them, but if you are curious, you will find a lot of info on our projects, on the state of the art, I would say. 
And I will just go through the projects very briefly. I will just touch some points, which for us are, I think, really, really interesting. But first of all, I will start describing our journey. <laughs> journey through the adoption of big data and official statistics. We started this journey so many years ago. We have some good results. Some are promising. In some cases, there is still a lot of work to be done. But I mean, it's still not uh, the end of the story, I would say. So first of all, big data here at ESTAT. Why, when, and how? So let's start with why and when. I, I mean, I think that you are all aware about a bit of the story of big data in the European statistical system. We start with sharing a memorandum back in 2013, nearly 10 years ago, huge amount of time. And in that period, we started uh, studying big data sources, trying to apply big data sources in official statistics, but it was, uh, I mean, a, a long way still to go. Then in 2018, we have this Bucharest Memorandum and we start talking about trusted smart statistics. So there are some keywords presented this morning. We talk about trustness, we talk about smart data, and we feel that we have a little bit more, we are aware of the complexity of the work that has to be done. And Eurostat sponsored some projects, but again, there is still a lot of work to do. And um, which are the main goals? Okay, you can imagine, we want to produce new products for our respondents. Respondent. We want to enhance the timeliness of our products, and we want to continue uh, being relevant. I think this is a very important keyword. So the relevance of official statistics in the new data ecosystem. Okay, there is an image on the right just to give an idea of what's going on out there. We have huge numbers of video, tweets, posts on social media, and so on and so forth. So, uh, how uh, official statistic has to react to a world that is changing so fast? I cannot give uh, an overview of what's happening out there, but I can say what's going on in Istat. We started back in 2013, with the first big data committee. Then we had in 2015, the first roadmap for big data adoption at ESTAT. Then we had the second committee. I have to be fast. And most important today, we have this trusted smart statistics. Uh, I would say a very high level uh, group, which contains top managers of ESTAT. And somehow their goal is to provide a roadmap which is shifting over time and guides at a strategic level investments in the context of big data. And this is the how. Um, operational dimensions. It's hard. If you want to adopt big data and official statistics, you have to invest in several aspects, a lot of dimensions. We have partnerships with mobile network operators, academia, private companies, which data sources? Uh, we saw some of them this morning. You saw some uh, yesterday with some, some uh, later in the morning. Web data, Twitter data, satellite images, huge amount of data sources. Then the use. Uh, Eurostat proposed some years ago, and we are quite keen to this, to start with experimental statistics. New data, new data source, a lot of problems. We want to start. Uh, doing some kind of experiments. If our results are good enough for the respondents, but the level of quality is not high, or has the right level for statistical production, we go on experimental statistics. And we're pushing hard on this. Another experimental statistics should be available at the end of the year, I hope. And regulation, we have GDPR, uh, the Data Act, we have to be aware of uh, the problem related to privacy. Uh, of our respondents. An IT investment, this, okay, I could talk about this for uh, maybe a, one, a half a day, but uh, I mean, if we change the data source, we change the way we process our data, we need a lot of investments, which can be from the IT perspective, so cloud architecture, which could be on premise in the cloud, the national cloud, but this adds a level of complexity to the design, to the framework. And then we need investment in the methodological, I would say, uh, dimension. And this is what 
I would like to talk a little bit now. So um, the methodological aspect, I mean, we all know that it's something really big. We need to invest a lot in methods for, I would say, new data preparation pipelines. We have text, images, which are quite different from a survey questionnaire that we were used to work on for so many years. And then we have this new inference paradigm. Uh, I mean, I just wrote machine learning. It's, it, it's just a fuzzy one, just to give you an idea that something new is happening out there. And we have to be aware of these uh, changes. But this means that we have to invest there. OK? And then there is also the access to external sources, uh, private data. And we need to invest on privacy preserving methods. We have now a small team responsible of this, uh, now in the methodology directorate and we are investing uh, in this direction. So uh, what about the projects? I have just a few minutes uh, left. I will just go through them just to give you an idea of uh, the investment ESTA is doing in this direction. So we have text processing pipelines, for example, the enterprise characteristics project. We start scraping the website of enterprises to grab some information web ordering, job vacancy, link to social media. And in order to do this, we have a complex pipeline, which is somehow modeled here. We have to scrape the data, put it in a database. We have a data preparation pipeline, which is quite complex, and we are working, pushing hard there. And then there is the data analysis pipeline. But this, I think it's important because it gives an idea of all the things. Two minutes, one minute. Ah, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Just to give you an idea of the complexity. Uh, there is the, the Social Mood and Economy Index and Experimental Statistics. We're working on this since many years. There are a lot of investments here because this topic of natural language processing and sentiment analysis, there is a huge hype there. And we, are, we, we will have a meeting with Zhang in, in the afternoon to get some advice in this direction. I, I will go fast here. Land cover projects, so satellite images. Fabrizio will describe this in a few minutes, <laughs> uh, I would say. We invested a lot there, and there are open challenges, as you can imagine. And last but not least, the new experimental statistics that I hope is going to be available next. OK, OK. But I hope it's going to be available by the end of the uh, year. It's called uh, Terra import-export network uh, analysis. It's, it started as a prototype during the big data hackathon in 2021. We produced good results. Our top management said, OK, it seemed, we think that we could invest a little bit farther on this. And now uh, I hope that by the end of December, it will be available to all our respondents. It's, it is, for me, it's super important because it has a modern, I would say, data processing pipeline, but we also invest in the data visualization part, so new methods to disseminate uh, data to our respondents. Here, I think you can see it there, some uh, print screen, screenshot of the dashboard. Something is changing. Uh, it's really, it's public available. If you go on the website, you will <laughs> see it, but I mean, uh, the link to uh, Eastern website will be available in by the end of the year. Okay, concluding uh, remarks. Um, a lot of investment in the last 10 years on internal capacity building. We, if we want to uh, face uh, problems related to new data sources, we need to invest on methods, tools, and on people. And so we need to train them and we need to hire new resources. Uh, there are experimental statistics there someone in play, online since many years, someone are going to be available at the end of the year. And then we have this trusted smart statistics roadmap that somehow drives our investment in big data context. Finito. <laughs> sorry for running. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Marjorie, if I, if I no, sorry, my intervention was not very successful. I want to give the sign of how many minutes, minutes left, but I think there was some misunderstanding. So, if, <laughs> but I'm sorry about that. So actually, we had a little bit of time. So, okay. Um, 
Fine. Uh, okay. My apologies. Um, so let's let's move on to the next speaker, uh, uh, Fabrizio. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Fabrizio De Fausti. I work uh, as data scientist uh, in uh, Istat. And uh, a challenging uh, aspect of my work is the use of new sources, no survey big data, uh, as uh, uh, social media data, uh, mobile network data, and uh, remote sensing data to uh, produce and support uh, the output of the official statistics. Uh, in uh, today, I, I present uh, a deep learning approach to uncover uh, estimation from satellite imagery. Uh, this work is collaboration with my colleagues, Erika Cerasti, Angela Pappagallo, Francesco Pugliese, and Diego Zardetto. Uh, what is the land cover? Land cover is the observed biophysical cover of the Earth's surface. An important aim of land cover studies is to estimate the area of the land occupied by a certain category of entities, forest, crop, and so on. Uh, the uh, land cover and soil is uh, an important, uh, uh, important topic. Uh, there is uh, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. It's an uh, important topic. Um, uh, th there are uh, two main uh, European project in uh, uh, in Europe. Corinne and Cover is a project uh, of, uh, that return a cartography of land cover, and Lucas is a, a project that return estimation of uh, uh, land cover uh, and is a sample survey. Uh, they are uh, important and uh, high quality project, but uh, has uh, uh, many uh, disadvantage. Uh, they are very costly. costly. Uh, they are complex, uh, uh, very complex production pipeline, and uh, uh, need heavy human uh, wor workload. Uh, and uh, need uh, and uh, have uh, low time frequency dissemination. Uh, Lucas uh, have uh, every uh, three years and uh, uh, Corillian cover every six years. Our goal in uh, our uh, uh, experimentation is uh, given an input satellite image of an area of interest, we want an automatic system able to classify the territory according to some taxonomy, the uncovered taxonomy, uh, quantify, quantify the area of the territory covered by each land cover class. This uh, uh, can give uh, benefit, uh, very timely land cover statistics, land cover estimation of sub-regional uh, area level. I remark that, uh, that uh, Lucas uh, have uh, um, uh, regional uh, level estimate. Uh, and uh, reduce the production, uh, the, uh, reduce the production cost. To uh, obtain this, uh, uh, this uh, goal, we use the satellite images. Uh, the uh, European Copernicus Constellation project is a great project. Uh, is uh, uh, that uh, for the monitoring of uh, planet in many ecosystem, uh, land, water, atmosphere, uh, in particular, there are six uh, family of uh, satellite, Sentinel-1 and 2 uh, are specialized for land, 
and uh, we uh, and uh, for uh, uh, land cover uh, uh, estimate uh, we use these uh, uh, two uh, uh, satellite data in particular for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, project we use the data of sentinel 2 uh, for uh, automatic approach to land cover by uh, um, satellite image, uh, there are a standard uh, approach with spectral signature. Uh, is based on the, uh, that different land cover classes have different reflectance spectra, and the variation of reflectance with the electromagnetic frequency can be used to predict land cover classes. Uh, the decision on each pixel does not depend uh, on uh, netboarding pixel, but just the uh, spectral uh, signature on uh, each pixel. In the other approach that we use, uh, we call a computer vision approach that use uh, deep learning. Deep learning is, is the state of art uh, for the recognition of the uh, image. Uh, we um, is based uh, on fact that uh, different land cover classes have different visual special pattern. Trained machine learning algorithm predicts land cover classes uh, a class of image pixel based on information from netboarding pixels. So the correlation in image, uh, spatial correlation is very important and the decision on each pixel depend on the wall image the pixel belong to. Um, the, the approach is like a human photo interpreter uh, classify a uh, land cover image. Uh, this is an intuition of uh, our uh, system. Uh, we have a trained deep learning CNN, in particular Inception V3. And uh, uh, here we have the uh, area of interest uh, input satellite image. We divide this uh, uh, image in a grid with the square of 640 meters for 640 meters. Each pixel is, uh, X square is an image that is the input of the uh, neural network and uh, the neural network classify the uh, input image uh, as uh, uh, the taxonomy, in this case is residential. And each pixel is uh, uh, classified, X uh, square is classified uh, by the, uh, the network. And uh, in uh, this uh, uh, example, we have selected just the um, residential square uh, classified on the, uh, on the network. And the estimate of the residential class is the share of the square, the number of square over the total square. Uh, I, I come back. Uh, okay. Uh, another important output of this approach is that produce also a map, not only uh, a, not only a estimate of land cover. To train our uh, neural network, we need a data set. We use data set Eurosat, available online. Um, use the Sentinel-2 uh, data uh, images. Uh, the uh, images are uh, georeferenced label uh, 640 for 640 meters. Uh, there are 10 different land cover classes, uh, annual crop, river, forest, residential, industrial, highway, pasture, permanent crop, sea lake, and uh, herbaceous vegetation. Uh, the, um, uh, this uh, uh, data set is available on two versions, RGB with uh, uh, 10 for 10 meters resolution and multispectral with uh, uh, 13 bands. 
Uh, this is our uh, approach that we call the classify and count approach, but we have a problem, estimate pro overestimate problem, uh, in particular for uh, Eurosat lane shape classes, uh, river and highways. Uh, this is, in this uh, 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 example, we have an Im image of river, of course, this is a, a river uh, cl a class, but uh, around the river there is uh, other uh, land cover. Uh, for example, here we have vegetation, uh, crop or, uh, um, or uh, forest. This leads to overestimate of this class. So to overcome this problem, we apply two unit neural networks specialized for segmentation of river and highway classes. Uh, this is uh, uh, the neural network specialized for segmentation that uh, is a unit uh, network. We have the imaging, the tile, uh, the square uh, in input and uh, the uh, unit return in output another image but image with the segmentation of the uh, river class uh, for, for the input image. The unit neural network associates each pixel inside the tile to presence or absence of river class. This produces more details output, but this is not free. Uh, the, we have to build a new data set for each classes which, uh, um, uh, which uh, um, label, mask label. Uh, so to build this uh, data set, uh, we use auxiliary information by for the, the river class by Copernicus high resolution la layer. Uh, we uh, have built this data set with 1,500 validated segmentation mask, and we build another data set with the same technique uh, for highway uh, classes uh, using OpenStreetMap uh, auxiliary information. We are re uh, proud uh, of this uh, data set created, and we are ready to publish and share. Um, after uh, the, the last uh, step of this pipeline is uh, the merging of these three output, the CNN A2 uh, unit, uh, according, overlapping, according to a, a hierarchy that depends on the degree of confidence we have on each algorithm. This is uh, an example of our output applied uh, to map of uh, Toscany. Uh, we have the, the output and we have a details of, uh, uh, of um, Arno uh, Basin uh, around Pisa. Uh, we can see the uh, contour of uh, the river and the highway uh, and the uh, aerial classes, uh, forest, uh, residential, Pisa, uh, residential, and the uh, industrial area around Pisa. And this is a, a, an example of estimate of land cover. So, in conclusion, uh, land cover statistics can benefit from machine learning methods and algorithms to achieve a high degree of automation in map and statistical production. This will decrease the effort and cost and improve the frequency of the output. Classify and count generates good estimate for the uh, land cover area uh, classes and uh, unit approach improve estimate but needs data set with specific max label. In the future, we could explore the possibility to assign label using information from administrative sources, regional technical chart, cadastral map, and agri agricultural census to extend unit approach to other land cover classes. 
that uh, we can use further information such uh, radar uh, SAR data from Sentinel-1 Sentinel or uh, Sentinel image obtained in different seasons. This can uh, improve uh, the, the recognition, uh, recognition, the classification of a particular class as crop. Introducing a time, uh, a, a, a time dependent uh, input. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Uh, so we move on to our discussant, uh, Pete Das, please. Thank you. I'll remove my glasses because otherwise I'm, I won't be able to see my own slides. Yeah, I have 20 minutes. Um, let me start by complimenting the writers of the papers and the present presenters because I find it very interesting work. But I'm, I'm going to be critical today, so, so uh, be aware. But it's constructive criticism. So that shouldn't be a problem. Um, I was asked to look at uh, two papers, and those papers dealt with the use of text for official statistics, so about enterprise characteristics, social mood on the economy, and the use of images for official statistics. That's the presentation that just uh, 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 was shown to you about land use and maps, and, and one uh, statistic that's on development. Uh, text and images are typical big data uh, uh, topics. So that really uh, uh, covers um, the most important points. And I really like those topics. So if I read those papers, I, I'm, I'm going to dive into the details. So I have lots and lots of questions. But um, enterprise characteristics, uh, what I'm going to do is I, I give a slide about one topic, comment on, on what I've seen, try to summarize it a bit, and then uh, uh, give a response from the Statistics Netherlands perspective, or at least the, exper uh, the expertise I have. Uh, and I think it will, will, will hopefully guide you in the right direction. I will do that for all of the topics, depending on the time. <laughs> and I have some two additional slides as well, so I'm not making sure how this presentation will end, but I might skip a topic. Uh, enterprise characteristics, it's a nice overview of the total process. It has been running around since 2018, so it should be okay. Um, the aim is to produce statistics on website related activities, but this is a topic that, that could be used more than, than just collecting enterprise characteristics. Uh, it's mentioned that a machine learning classifier is used to produce big database results. There's a trick for machine learning classification. Uh, machine learning uh, classifiers might be biased depending on the data source you use. And if you compare the big data results with the survey data based findings, then it's stated that usually the results are very similar. And I, and I wonder how similar, and, and I want to know details, I want to know confidence intervals, and, and sometimes a correction is needed. I'm curious how that's being done, and, and that's being done by auxiliar. Yeah, I can't pronounce this word, so I always use the word background characteristics um, in both data sets. Uh, but you can do, you can do much more. Uh, in my opinion, web pages are a very, very good data source for, for big data. Why? You're in control. You're, you're the organization that collects uh, the data from web pages. So all the other big data sources uh, uh, have the downside that you are dependent on what another organization is, uh, often a private organization is doing. But in the case of web pages, you are the organization that controls the scraping. Uh, and, and much of the successes in our office regarding big data are related to the use of web pages. So, so there's more potential here. You, you could do much more then only provide enterprise characteristics. But I'm not sure how this process is set up. I guess it's uh, set up as a specific web scraping uh, uh, topic. So that means you visit the web page and then extract the relevant uh, uh, features on those pages. I'm more into generic web scraping, store a web page and then do the analysis later on because it has the advantage you can't scrape the parts. So, so if 
at a certain point in time you have data, you can do analysis on that and, and uh, scrape additional data in the near future. Um, the main use in our office, the, the best successes regarding uh, webscape data are uh, the possibility to create a so-called enriched subpopulation. So I have somebody in our office who asked me, Pete, can you assist me in, in the analysis of, I want to detect platform economy companies. A platform economy company is an organization that um, if you order food online, that's the typical example, restaurants can connect to that organization and people that search for food can use the website to order a specific food. The organization that uh, coordinates that uh, activity, that's the platform organization. So they have, they typically have a website and, and uh, that part of, of our office was interested in, in obtaining the turnover of platform economies. That's certainly interesting during COVID. Turnover isn't on a website, but you can use those websites to identify the subpopulation relevant for platform e economy. And the next thing we did is after building a model and, and identifying those uh, uh, platform organizations was sending, uh, sending them a questionnaire uh, containing lots of uh, lots of uh, questions related to the turnover and their activities. That's a very interesting combination of, of using big data and, and classic survey sampling. And that that's I don't I haven't seen that on Easter yet, and I think that's an opportunity you, sh you should use. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking up too much time now, but that's because I'm very enthusiastic about certain topics. <laughs> The other thing is if you develop a machine learning classifier, then depending on, on the data set you use and if that's found data or if that's a convenient sample, <clears throat> sorry, then your uh, machine learning classifier might be biased. Um, and that's mainly affected by the ratio of positive and negative examples if, if you're talking about machine learning, learning classifiers. Uh, there's a correction method for that available. Uh, we developed that. My colleague uh, has developed that. It's available on GitHub and it automatically corrects for any bias caused by uh, using a very strange ratio of positive and negative examples. Just to indicate that there's already work being done there. And I'm, I'm the key word of this meeting, and certainly I also uh, noticed it yesterday, is validation. So I'm going to state it three times, validation, validation, validation. If you talk about big data, think about validation. Because it's great that you have a big data source in which you can measure something, and uh, the next example will illustrate that. Are you sure you're measuring the concept that you originally intended to measure? That 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 that's a very, very essential question. Certainly, certainly, if you want to produce official statistics on that. Um, and this is a an example of of of. Uh, where validation is essential. We we I was involved in the project that measures something similar, not to the economy. This is the social mood on economy index. But if you use big data and you have an idea, are we going to use social media to detect the social mood on the economy? In the end, when you're nearly finished, you have to ask yourself the question, am I still measuring the social mood on the economy or am I measuring something else? And it's a, a, a very challenging uh, uh, thing to investigate, but it's essential that you do that. I really like this topic. It's based on daily samples of tweets, and I was really enthusiastic that I saw that it was 47,000 tweets. That should be enough to get a clear idea what's going on per day. It's a keyword-based selection. I'm curious, what are the words? Because those words already define what you might extract from your social media. I guess there are words related to economy, but I'm not sure, and, and that's sort of a whitelist. And I wonder, uh, because the people that, that have written that story uh, run into quite uh, uh, typical problems when they start to do some cluster analysis or, or a sentiment classification. I wonder if there's also a blacklist of words, so you, uh, words used to exclude, because uh, there's a lot of non-relevant messages on social media, to say the least. It's highly dependent on Twitter, and I can't resist uh, stating that what happens if Twitter stops? What happens if Elon Musk uh, starts doing strange things? It's something you have to keep in mind because if you're going to use this as an experimental product, then it's okay. But if it becomes more, then there's a risk of dependency here. And, and what happens if 
people in Italy massively leave Twitter and start uh, sending messages on another platform. Uh, it's a daily mood on the economy, so I thought, okay, wow, you can produce something every day, which is uh, what we like to do, but it's published every quarterly, so, oh, something is going on there. Try at least to produce a weekly indicator or something like that, that's my suggestion. Um, I uh, really like the uh, lexicon-based uh, unsupervised uh, uh, sentiment classification. That's something new, so I was uh, intrigued by it. It results in clusters of positive, negative, and neutral, and, and the positive and negative are used to, to obtain the daily index. I guess this takes quite a while. I guess this is, might be the reason why you can't produce a daily mood uh, uh, lex uh, indicator. I'm just curious how this works. And they use sort of an anomaly detection approach, so to deal with off-topic issues. That's something that typically happens on social media. Um, just imagine that you have a social mood and economy index and everything is going down and suddenly the Italian, whatever sport you have, wins and becomes the world champion. This will affect your social mood. I'm, I'm, at least it will affect the sentiment on social media and that might affect your social mood. So that's the reason to deal with that and that's what I really like. So that's a great uh, uh, idea. Um, and they talk about some additional uh, stuff they're doing. Um, as stated yesterday in the morning, um, I can say something about if words cloud, of, of, uh, sorry, if, if word embeddings might work or not, just try and see what happens. Usually that provides a better clue than, than all the other things. I'm going to skip a few things. Um, from the statistic knowledge perspective, uh, we had a similar project uh, on what we call the social unrest indicator that's based on social media and it, it tries to measure unrest in, in online society as a proxy for unrest in the society, which is really interesting during COVID because it really spiked. Um, we, were even, uh, we even have produced this as, as an experimental indicator for a year, so there was an active dashboard. And when we stopped doing that, the police and the Ministry of Justice asked us if we could produce that on a regular basis. So we were in the process of creating an official statistics based on social media. Unfortunately, last week it was decided that, that it won't be an official product, it will still be a beta indicator, which suggests that some products are, are not considered of enough quality to become an official statistical product. And that has to do with the fact that for an experimental statistics, your, your, um, your demands are not as high as for an official product. There's a difference there. So sometimes it's a good thing to keep something experimental. I immediately understood why Google uh, says that everything is a better product. I totally agree because it, it, it makes life a lot uh, easier. But the principal question here, and that's the question we investigated for the social unrest indicator, what are we actually measuring? You start with the idea of, of in this case, measuring social mood and economy. You do clustering, you do a selection based on words, uh, you adjust uh, uh, the findings you have, and then you come up with a very nice pattern that's shown in the paper. And you can see from that pattern that's affected by COVID and after COVID, there are some things going on. Is that related to the economy or is that related to something else? You, you really need to do a validation study. And I'm not saying it's easy, um, but when our new bad product, the social unrest indicator is online available, there will be a report in Dutch, but using DeepL you can translate it to Italian, so that won't be a problem. There are lots of examples in there on, on how you can validate or try to validate this. And otherwise you just call me because this is a really interesting topic to, uh, to look at. So be aware that not every experimental statistics might become an official product and that is related to uh, lots of other stuff. Uh, um, not always, uh, 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 there are not always logical relations used in those discussions. The third topic is about land use and maps. Uh, it's about creating an automatic land cover estimation system. Uh, I looked at it, I was really enthusiastic about it because it's really technological oriented. But even for me, it's a bit too technical. And I'm thinking, 
we want to reduce the production costs. And if I read the paper, then I think, wow, this is a lot of work. This is extremely detailed. In that sense, it's it's very interesting, but it's very computational intensive. And, and I wonder how many methodologists were involved in this project, because there should be somebody in that project that says, uh, okay, guys, I guess they're all guys that done this work. Uh, what was our intentional target? What, what was the reason why we started this project? So I, I'm a bit critical about it, because um, it really looks good, and it really dealt with the highway and the rivers uh, that were overestimated. But what about the rest? I'm, I'm missing accuracy numbers here. What, what about the classification of forest? Is that OK or not? That hasn't been done. And in the case of, of, of satellite pictures, there is something called the ground truth. You can go visit that area and see how accurate everything is. So, And it's a good idea to use admin data here as input. I think that should be done early on in the project. But, but I really appreciate the amount of work and detail that's going on in here. Um, we've done some uh, in statistics, uh, some work on deep learning models. I'm not a huge fan because they have a tendency to be extremely uh, accurate uh, for the test set. So just an example, I'm not sure how much time I have yet, but <laughs> uh, we've done some work on detecting solar panels on rooftops in the city of Heerle, where our office is. Okay, yeah. Um, that model was highly accurate, 96% accuracy. That was really great. But when we applied uh, that deep learning model to detect solar panels on the rooftop of Maastricht, which is a larger city, fairly close, the accuracy dropped to 70%. So overfitting. Uh, you have no idea what kind of features it picks up. I guess not only solar panels. So I wonder if, if, if how this the model that's being developed, how sure uh, does that approach work on unseen parts of Italy? I hope it detects rivers and highways well. I assume it, it will, but that's something you need to test. And is there an alternative for that? Uh, I'm just curious what the current accuracy is on all the other things. I have to say something about black box approaches and official statistics. That could be an issue. Transparency is very important. Validation helps in accepting that. Um, the Terra experiment was a bit difficult for me to, to read and understand. It is, it is work in progress, and it's a very interesting uh, thing. And luckily, the presentation of uh, Mauro explained uh, uh, to me why they were doing that. It's still under development, and it's a dashboard. Curious, it's, it contains a combination of R and Python. Wow, those are two words that don't collide. So somehow something special has been done in that uh, project. And it, it collects huge amounts of uh, data from Eurostat every month. There's a relation with Google Mobility, which they already indicate that will soon be lost. This is typical of something that could happen with big data. You need to take care of that or, or try to anticipate that that happens. And I think it's a very nice example of a big data-based dashboard that will certainly assist you and, and, and people that, are, uh, um, that look at the data. I was curious about the initial reason for developing the application. Uh, sometimes things happen because they are interested, I wonder, although that was already a bit explained in the, in the presentation. So what about the view from our office? Um, some very interesting observations during Corona. There, there, there was a, a, a need for more dashboards in our office at Statistic Netherlands. Uh, and, and a number of statistics were produced at, at a higher frequency and, and, and made available much faster, but they had nothing to do with big data. They just realized that they could speed up the internal process fairly easily and, and, and not by using more rapidly available data, but just by uh, speeding up the internal process. So not for every solution big data is the answer. Um, the dashboard certainly help users to provide quick insight could be something you could use for other types of statistics as well, yeah. Okay, some general remarks about uh, validation. What are the first three things I always look at when I look at a big data project? Um, they're not in the right order, I have to admit. Uh, the first thing I look at is comparability over time. I would have never published the relation between uh, social media sentiment and consumer confidence if I hadn't repeatedly found that over time, so that's, it, it's stable. Uh, that's at least the most easiest way to deal with spurious correlations. 
The second thing I look at is what are we actually measuring here? What's the concept? Uh, is it still the concept that we in, uh, uh, intended to be measured? Because when you're not responsible for the data collection, you're dependent on what others uh, are doing. So check, try to determine what it is. And then the most difficult one is the population perspective. Uh, I don't have to explain how difficult uh, creating a social media indicator is and then taking care of the population aspect. But it's an important one. If you can't answer that question, I think you should keep it experimental at, at this point in time. And then validation, just check everything to make sure that, that you claim what you're measuring is actually correct. Then briefly something about machine learning and, and uh, you should call it AI. If you do machine learning now, just call it artificial intelligence. Uh, a year ago, I wrote a paper with a colleague of mine about important topics regarding machine learning. And I'm not using this to indicate oh, what kind of interesting work we do, but look at the, the uh, list of things that we think should be studied in the context of machine learning. A lot of these topics should be familiar for survey methodologists. It's about uh, uh, obtaining representative training sets. It, it, it's about using stratification and all those things. We can learn a lot from each other here. I'm done. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Exactly on time. Huh? Uh, so now we move on to Sandro, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Sandro Cruciani. Um, I work for, e for ISTAT in the um, Directorate for uh, Environment and uh, Territorial Statistics. So um, thank you for, uh, for this invitation uh, uh, that uh, allows me to express the point of view of the statistical production. But uh, I hope that to be able to provide a useful, useful contribution to continue investing in these uh, issues. Um, I believe, um, of course, uh, I'm not an expert of big data and methodologies, but uh, I think that this occasion it could be useful for, to, because I would like also to be uh, a skilled user. We want to be a skilled user of this uh, data in, uh, because we need, we need uh, for the future to invest in these topics. Um, in fact, I believe that the, uh, the path of using big data to produce official statistics is now shared and defined in, in its main features. The successful experience and the many positive results that can be collected on the international scene, I think can confirm this statement. Uh, I would like also to stress what uh, our colleague from Netherlands uh, said in his, in, uh, his contribution. Uh, we must be uh, honest and so going deep or <laughs> in the suggestion uh, he gave us uh, on this contribution. Um, also in ISTAT, uh, the experience described in the two papers previously illustrated, although in some cases are still characterized by an experimental approach, show us that the, our institute can benefit from these new approaches these new methodologies and these new data. New data and new methodology also for us, for uh, uh, the people who are not involved, directly involved in methodologies. Some experience uh, have, uh, have been um, already become part of the current production, such as the use of the scanner data used to calculate consumer price. Therefore, in some cases uh, where the condition for more favorable and, ish, and the issues related to calculation difficulties are less important, the use of big data no longer represents a frontier. Um, uh, recently, in, uh, I've been in a, in a meeting organized by the UN, uh, United Nations in, um, in Indonesia, and they present uh, um, a, a lot of uh, um, in interesting experience in uh, using big data and uh, methodology to approach the big data. 
Uh, for example, one of the uh, most in interesting things for us that uh, uh, I'm involved with also in uh, maritime statistics, for example, the, uh, a global platform to collect and investigate in um, AIS uh, data, the, the vessels, the um, uh, ruled by the satellite, and so you can understand um, which uh, ship can go from one point to another, one port to another port. So for us, that we are, we check for. Uh, uh, data we collect directly on the on the um, on the on the floor uh, is it's a very important check to also to um, to check the uh, statistics at, at the global level <laughs> from uh, to 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 put in coherence the Italian for example the Italian statistics with the French statistics on maritime transport so I think that. Uh, could be uh, a really interesting um, approach. And the United Nations gives us free, uh, for free data and methodologies and software. That is, I, key, I, I think is very, a very important, <laughs> a very important uh, issue. So um, I invite our colleague to go in deep in this, uh, in these topics. Um, However, I believe that to continue in a useful way, some important aspect, uh, two important aspects must be shared. Uh, first of all, uh, techniques and methodology are in obviously indispensable as well as their evolution to provide increasing, increasing precise results. However, it's important that the results obtained are shared and discussed through a comparison with the thematic reference. So, not just technology, please. Uh, the second point is, uh, I think that it's necessary to evaluate the overall, overall results obtained through the application of such complex models, as uh, our colleague uh, Mr. Das said before. For example, it's necessary to truly evaluate the accuracy of the result obtained, at the same, uh, for example, a confusion matrix for the land cover um, estimation that uh, Fabrizio um, explained us before. Um, another important ele element is the issue of the investment that must be addressed to standardize this methodology and this data. Uh, the issue of the investment for a national statistical office is a, a strategic uh, topic, I think. Uh, the, first, um, uh, the first issue is, of course, technological. The application of this method and the management of a large amount of data re require an adequate IT e equipment, so uh, also a financial, financial investment. The second, but I think is the more important investment, is, uh, is in terms of human resource and the adequate skills. I think there is a lack of resources in uh, most of the national institutes uh, to manage this kind of data and this, uh, this kind of methodology. Uh, if you want, if we want to put in a, in a pipeline to production this kind of data, this kind of methodology, we need uh, a, a, an investment, a, a huge investment in human resource because it's strategic for a, to manage this, kind, this amount of data, this amount of the methodology. Um, I would like to close with a, a one final consideration. Uh, the National Statistics Institute must work together to address the challenges, not only for technological uh, reason, for the use of this methodology and this data. Sharing approach and experience will make everything much more usable. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for the uh, point of view from productions. So now we uh, open for the floor discussion. Um, I'm going to do a little bit uh, change from yesterday. So I will invite the comments from the audience or, or, or directly without necessarily immediately asking the 
presenters to respond. Okay, we will see how much you want to say first. <laughs> please go ahead. Monica, please. I just want to make a, a general comment on, uh, on what we uh, saw in the morning, what we listened and uh, the comments by, uh, by Pete. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, uh, one thing that uh, um, we, I, I would like to remark with respect to uh, what has been presented on uh, um, Big Data Project is that uh, um, it was an overview of uh, several projects. So uh, given uh, this kind of a presentation, of course, uh, uh, we put in all the references uh, all the validation uh, efforts that have been made on, uh, uh, on the different projects. Uh, let's start from uh, the enterprise uh, uh, website uh, scraping project. Uh, the validation there was uh, uh, related to the comparison with the ICT survey estimates. So we used the, the ICT survey estimates uh, as a direct comparison. And uh, um, that's a reference there in which uh, all the results have been uh, specifically, specifically compared. Uh, I will very quickly go with respect to the other validation efforts. Uh, uh, social mood on economy. Uh, it was very, it is uh, still very difficult to, to validate the result of the social mundo economy. So I, I would not say that we have validated uh, uh, the result there, but uh, several validation efforts have been made. So uh, let me cite, for example, uh, uh, an effort that uh, it was made to um, to look for correlation of the social mood on economy with respect to uh, um, transactional data uh, because it was a specific kind of data and with the characteristic frequency characteristics uh, that uh, uh, we would like to investigate on and also on the quality of the filters uh, uh, going uh, in the details of the keywords that were used for the filters, uh, we did uh, several experimentation in order to understand uh, the impact uh, of the choose of the um, keyword of the filters, uh, of the filter on the result of the index. So we did this kind of effort, but uh, uh, let me say that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's currently a current research effort. So Probably it's not uh, yet ready, as you were saying, Pete, uh, for uh, official statistic production. But, but, and that's a good news, um, very recently there was uh, uh, added a question in our uh, multipurpose survey to characterize the population of, uh, uh, of twi tweeters. So that's uh, the kind of effort that uh, probably are necessary for uh, uh, going towards the direction of uh, uh, adding the index uh, as uh, uh, an official statistical product. Uh, and uh, last, with respect to land cover, uh, um, we did uh, a lot of confusion metrics for internal accuracy. It's hard to evaluate the external accuracy and to have a gold standard, uh, a reference standard for that, because it does not exist. And what I think could be a European effort, and we uh, also with uh, Orieta that uh, uh, at DIME ATDG of Eurostat is, is working in this direction, is to, to try to build this kind of a gold standard for validating the external accuracy of the results of the land cover project. Having proved that also the internal accuracy results are very good um, given, let's say, the, the, what we, we could do with what we had. Okay. Yes, thank you for really good presentations. I have two questions, one related to web scraping and uh, <clears throat> Based on Austrian examples, we experience, for instance, in job vacancy survey, 
when we <coughs> scrape job advertisement uh, or try to scrape job advertisement portals that we are blocked sometimes so by the web owner and this causes as well a source of error of incompleteness and i would be interested if there are some possibilities or efforts or already something available to handle this problem methodologically in some way or just the normal incompleteness second question is uh, of uh, related to the land cover uh, by satellite image as well in an austrian project we saw very huge differences depending on the crop type so if it's wheat or it is corn or anything else and i wonder if you had the same experiences because this was really a big problem in order to achieve to to come to a better model for harvesting uh, amount of harvesting and uh, a second uh, relation was a second observation was that of course having a survey in agricultural uh, is it's always a little bit a nightmare because the respondent farmers are not very let me say very willing respondents so what we received is very different figures uh, sometimes, so comparability problems as well, but that's only a remark. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Fabio is next. No, sorry, Fabio, Fabio, Fabio first and then Pierre. So a very <clears throat> general remark, uh, looking at all different data sources. So, so we have statistical data sources, survey census, registers and the whole zoo of uh, big or less big data. Don't, don't you think that maybe also in order to reconcile the institutional mandate of official statistics and the potential of these other data sources, and at the same time taking stock of the experience of register data, no? where register data have not replaced completely the survey, but have changed the role of survey as an instrument to complement and adjust and improve and fertilize the registered data. Perhaps we should always think that in order to validate, validate calibrate, adjust also so-called big data, we will always probably need to conduct some survey that is designed ad hoc to fertilize, uh, to correct, uh, uh, you know, the, the huge amount of information that comes from the, from this data. In this sense, also from an institutional point of view, it would, the, the, the picture would be a bit more balanced because statistical office would not only, let's say, take from the private sector something in terms of you know, data from private sector. Most of this data happened to be produced in the private sector, but we'd also give something in the sense of, of uh, um, launching, designing and launching surveys that are meant, you know, to make sense of the big data and to, uh, let's say, to solve for the numerous um, problems in terms of validation and trustworthiness and qualities, etc. Et so if we start thinking that probably we will never, very bold statement just to, just to feed the discussion, I'm not sure we will ever be able to jump from stat experimental statistics to something that uh, aspire to become an official statistics without merging some big data with some design-based maybe survey. What the audience think about this? Thank you. Piero, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the session was very interesting. We we have seen at uh, the step a step in transition from uh, experimental statistics to more uh, mature objects of official statistics, and this uh, leverage for a step in uh, improving our. Uh, our production process. The, uh, I have appreciated a lot the presentation and the discussion. Uh, I have uh, to summarize the three keywords that 
can be summarized after these uh, two hours of presentation are the first is integration. Uh, the first is integration of using together uh, big data sources with, with less biased sources, uh, less, uh, as uh, we have seen integration of land data with administrative data, and even with uh, traditional sample surveys. So integration is keywords, but integration is a more general concept because it is even integration of competencies, um, integration of technologies of deep learning approaches with more traditional approaches of uh, statistical inference of uh, traditional methodologies. The second is validation is uh, a constant attention to validate of what we are presenting with big data statistics. The third concept that emerged on in this uh, very interesting two hours <laughs> presentation is the concept we are measuring. Indeed, uh, uh, in some uh, experiment, uh, uh, we see that we are measuring something that is uh, uh, different of traditional measurement of official statistics that uh, measure concepts that are stable in time, more or less, of, for, for instance, employment, uh, uh, revenue, and something called that. And we are uh, dealing with... Uh, something more transitive and uh, subjective, like opinions and so on. And, and so this is uh, really a new product, something different from what we have measured since now. Thank you. Thank you, Piero. If you just pass on to... Just a quick comment on top of that is, thank you for the session and for the discussion. At some point, um, Mauro said that the inferential par uh, paradigm or framework was uh, machine learning. And I've been thinking about that for the rest of the talk, but I, I would say that machine learning cannot be an inferential framework, cannot be an inferential paradigm. I think that it's just a method, a tool. It's not even a model, statistically speaking. It's just a tool, a method, say, the closest I can think is like when you do regression estimation, you, you have like a working method just to do the regression, but then you're essentially design based. So it's just a tool to find a good prediction for land cover, for example. But you can still do your inference. It can be either design based or model based. And the example from Fabrizio is really clear on that. Y you have to define your parameter of interest, your concept of interest, and it can be like on a smooth, continuous space. And there you can decide that you're going model-based or design-based, but your resolution, in a sense, is your sample. And then from your sample, which is like a systematic sample, you can try to build an accuracy measure. That can be design-based if you think that your measure is like a number, or it can be model-based if you're thinking of the overall mean that you're trying to estimate. So your final table that you had with those percentages, in a sense, you can easily attach a measure of accuracy there, either if you think about that in a design-based perspective or you think about that in a model-based perspective. You also, at some point, you said um, th there are good estimates. Those, so in your conclusion, one of your lines where those were good estimates, you can see how good the error of the estimate was, of the prediction was. Using that prediction error is the first step in building your accuracy measure. But, so, sorry about, but it was just like an overall comment on, on the framework and the contribution that we can give to the artificial intelligence um, uh, world. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Giovanna. So, uh, well, on this note, where the, where the machine learning has 10 of, 10 of.
Yes, whether machine learning has brought anything new in terms of in terms of epistemology, or is it just uh, something new in terms of ontology? Let's see. Uh, since I don't see any raised hands, I now invite the uh, uh, authors or the, the presenters to respond I, in the order of tomorrow. So hopefully, maybe you don't need to because of the time. So we don't need to respond to everything. Maybe pick one or two points, please. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. I would start with last comment, Professor. <laughs> Indeed, I will change the slides. I I completely agree with you. It was just to give a, a, a gener generic idea, but. You're right. It's not the correct way. So, uh, thank you very much. But I, and I also like the comment on the um, land cover project, and I think it could be a, a starting point to rethink about the uh, accuracy of our research. And then I have a comment for Pete. We need. I, I don't know how long it's going to take to answer to all your questions, but we, we will try to do uh, our best. And I think we will interact. Yeah, I would love to do the, this. Last but not least, yeah. it's for. Uh, Piero, he was my director. Piero, uh, I agree. I really, really like very much the integration point. It's not only methods and IT, but it's also about competencies. You have to change a little bit the way we do our work. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I uh, don't remember all, all, uh, all questions. Uh, but uh, I want to reply to Das uh, about, uh, uh, yes, uh, the ob objective of our analysis is the land use and uh, the land use estimation, have a land use estimation, but uh, a important product need when we overlapping uh, many models, uh, we need map. So uh, another uh, parallel product is estimate and uh, um, and uh, and map. Map is useful to uh, inspection of accuracy of uh, uh, of inference, but this is not a. a, a, a a, a, a mathematical measure is just uh, a quality measure, okay? Uh, another uh, point is the uh, analysis uh, for uh, all the region of Tuscany uh, is uh, uh, quite time consuming uh, for three days for uh, one region. Uh, reason. So uh, I think uh, uh, maybe we need uh, one um, one month for uh, entire uh, uh, Italy. That is a quite good uh, time for uh, a, a, a monitoring of changing uh, of land cover. Sure, uh, but we we can uh, uh, go faster if we use just unit for all the process, but the unit needs uh, spe specific uh, data set for each classes. Uh, for the uh, accuracy, uh, for the measure uh, of accuracy is very important, I know. We have uh, a lot uh, measure of accuracy in internal data set, as uh, Monica said. Uh, for the uh, accuracy of estimate, we can compare the estimate, for example, for uh, some classes of Lucas to regional level. Uh, for Tuscany, we can compare, for example, uh, forest that is uh, maybe uh, matching uh, uh, classes. Uh, we, uh, the Austrian case, we don't know the Austrian case in detail, but uh, for the crop, we, we uh, I, I know uh, quite well the Poland case for the crop. I don't know if uh, it's the same uh, algorithm and pipeline, but uh, they use a random forest and uh, detect for, the, for uh, a uh, average, uh, average statistics uh, of uh, radar and uh, 
um, and uh, uh, refle reflection uh, on the uh, catastial area. But uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, approach is not uh, properly uh, um, pattern approach as we, we, we want. Because our uh, approach is investigate and uh, approach with uh, uh, new, neural network and pattern recognition as uh, a uh, uh, human uh, photo interpreter. Uh, Okay, I I don't remember. Thank you. <laughs> the Pete, uh, maybe other question. Uh, thanks for the interesting questions. Uh, I'm I'm just going to focus on the ones that are I think are particularly interesting for me to answer. Monica, thank you for your excellent explanation. I, I would I would expect less. So I'm really pleased with that. Uh, usually, often a lot of checks are done, and people don't always report it but there are usually some initial validation things. And I would like uh, to focus on the question regarding web scraping. Uh, uh, I have a great example that the problem is with job vacancies and job advertisements that they on, not always match one-on-one. -on -one. There are ghost vacancies and not every vacancy is advertised online. Uh, we were lucky that we had the fortunate situation where we used uh, the Community Innovation Survey to detect innovative companies. The websites assigned to those large companies uh, were of high quality. So what we actually did was scrape everything and then uh, uh, used our classifier that was able to detect it to determine how many innovative companies there are. What are the corrections we made uh, for that estimate? Uh, there's a bias in the model. Um, uh, let's start by calling it type 1 and type 2 errors, false positive, false negative. They were not equal. The model underestimated a bit, so we corrected for that. The second thing we had to deal with, what about non-responding websites? Not every website allows you to scrape or it doesn't exist and you can't see the difference. Uh, we assumed that every website that didn't respond was not active. Doesn't, it wasn't included in the frame, let's call it that way. The websites that did respond but only provided uh, very few words, uh, that wasn't enough for the model to classify them properly. We looked at the content and, the, and, and I was expecting that the content of those websites would be domain for sale or something like that. But that wasn't the case, at least and not a lot. And then we assumed that they had a similar ratio as the uh, innovative and non-innovative companies. We corrected for that. And we even uh, uh, estimated based on the survey and, and some additional checks we did, the number of innovative companies without a website. That's 0.1% in the Netherlands. In the end, we ended up with an estimate that was very similar to the overall number provided by the survey. So that correction seems to work well, but that's the only experience I have. But we decided that non-responding websites were out of scope. Thank that's you. it. Uh, Sandro, you want to have the last word? <laughs> no? Okay, so uh, then... I